as Justin had mentioned, um, the Natural Hazards team is based out of Boulder, Colorado. And our focus of the Natural Hazards team is the creation of data for community preparedness and resilience to coastal hazards. Now you can see the different types of uh, data that we work with listed here. Um, we'll, the focus of this presentation will really be on the uh, historical tsunami events database, but we also have a hazards image database with images that are free to use to the pub for the public um, on different uh, geological hazards and their impacts. We also uh, archive and process uh, water level data for tsunamis. So this is uh, coastal tide gauge data, as well as bottom re pressure recorder data from DARTS. Now, this is mainly US stations, uh, we, although we do have some international stations and data that, that we uh, archive and process as well. And lastly, we do also develop digital elevation models uh, for the National Weather Service primarily, although we do other projects as well. Um, this is for tsunami modeling as well as a storm surge modeling are the primary uses of this. Of course, there's other uses as well. So, and the last thing you see listed here is that we do a lot, work with a lot of international agencies and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So just focusing on our work here uh, for the hazards team, we are part of the uh, NOAA's tsunami program and the uh, N10 tsunami warning system that NOAA has. So as you might know, NOAA's tsunami program mission is to provide tsunami forecasts and warnings to promote community and to pr promote community resilience. Our focus at NCEI to support uh, that mission is with data acquisition management and exchange. So you can see all the different partners on the image to the right of, of the NOAA tsunami program, as well as the states um, and territories that we are partners with. Uh, now, we have a lot of goals that we strive towards at NCI through our nat natural hazards team. But the, as far as the one of the NESDIS goals that is a bit of the focus of this effort that we're talking about this uh, tsunami events time lapse animation, uh, one of the main focuses was ensuring that the, our data reaches new users. So that was a really big part of uh, our motivation for doing this. And I'll talk a little bit about um, that later. So discussing uh, the natural hazards database that we have, um, this, our database contains data from past events to establish the record of natural hazard event occurrences. So this is historical data and the primary focus is tsunamis. However, we do have earthquake and volcanic eruption data, data but we do not steward all scientific data uh, for earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. We focus on uh, their relationship to tsunamis as well as socioeconomic impacts. So other agencies are in charge of uh, the, um, stewarding all the, that, the more comprehensive data for earthquakes and volcanoes such as USGS, IRIS, um, and Smithsonian to name a few. So here you can see the, the URL that for our database and all that data is downloadable um, in TSV formats so that you can uh, convert it easily to other formats for plotting or for uh, just your other uses that you may have. So just to give you a little bit of history of the database, um, the origins of the database extend as far back as the late 1950s when observations were preserved and made available through the World Data Center system. In 1957, as you can see listed here, um, data started to be collected by a Coast and Geodetic Survey in DC. And a few moves happened after that, um, but NGDC, which is the National Geophysical uh, Data Center, was began to steward that in the 1960s. And then it actually moved to the International Tsunami Information Center in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1969, where they be soon after began to computerize that tsunami data. Then in the early 70s, it went back to NGDC, but it was based in Boulder. And that's when we started uh, at NGDC to compile all the different tsunami data from different catalogs and special studies on tsunamis into one uh, centralized location and database. Now the World Data Center system uh, that was established went away and it was replaced by the World uh, Data System. So we actually at NCI service the World Data Service for Geophysics, which includes tsunamis. So being part of those services means we have we enable access to quality assured scientific data. We have a long-term stewardship of the, of the data and we um, foster and comply with data standards and we try to improve access to data, which is a big focus of, of what we're doing now. And just to let you know, NGDC ended up merging with three other data centers in 2015 and now we are part of NCEI, the National Centers for Environmental Data. 
uh, for environmental information, excuse me. And one last note I'd say is that originally this data and the database was focused on the Pacific. So that's where all the data was, we were focused on, we were not looking at the Mediterranean and Caribbean originally, but then in, a, in a, I wanna say approximately the 19, early 1990s, that changed and we started to have a global uh, look at tsunamis and tsunami sources. So just a little bit about the structure of the database. It is a relational database uh, in Oracle, stored in Oracle. Now you can see on the image on the right here um, that we have a few different tables, as I mentioned, tsunami events might be related to volcanic eruptions or earthquakes. And there's of, of course other causes, but those are the two that we really focus on having more information for. So for tsunamis, the true critical tables we have are the tsunami events table and the tsunami run-up run records. So um, run-up records being like, in this case, we're, we're, we're meaning run-up records as in tsunami observations. Um, so not just run-ups as in the type of uh, observation. And also one thing that's really important is that you'll see references at the top. So for every event and run up in our database, uh, every record entry, we do have at least one reference or source document associated with it. And that's listed for the user to see so that they know where we, we, where we uh, got that information so that they can do more research because we can't always provide every field of data or every uh, comment that's provided in, in a rec uh, from a source. So just to discuss the uh, tsunami events table, um, the different types of fields we have, uh, date, time, location, uh, validity of the tsunami, maximum water height and socioeconomic impacts. And as I mentioned, references or source documents. Now, um, one of the more important ones is validity. And so I've discussed here, we kind of, we, we have six different types of validities that we assign to a tsunami. Uh, but for the purposes of this uh, and conversation and animation, we, we're really just looking at in the high and low validity events. So a high validity event being something that we consider a quote unquote confirmed tsunami that's been recorded on, a, on a, perhaps a tide gauge or some sort of instrumentation that's been reported by many sources and it's, um, that we feel is very reliable that this is definitely a tsunami that occurred. Now we have lower validity events that may be prior to instrumental recordings, or some an example might be that uh, the observations reference an earthquake, but there's no information on that earthquake in any catalogs that we've seen. So that might be considered a lower validity event. Now we do have uh, over 45 fields for our tsunami events uh, d tables. We um, of course, aren't showing them all here, but on the right side, you can see some, what it might look like, your search results might look like. You can click on an event and then get more information on that particular event or the earthquake if it's associated with one, as well as the run-ups, the observations for it. And this is downloadable, as I mentioned, and it has multi-level uh, sorting capabilities. So you can sort the way you need it to. Um, I guess one last thing I'll say is about the validities is this is not a rigid criteria. These are loose and flexible. The further you go back in time, um, as anyone that's familiar with historical data will know, a little bit murkier, messier things get. So it's hard to have a very rigid uh, set of standards of what falls in what validity. For the tsunami run-up tables, we have a lot of similar fields, um, as you can see listed here, but I'd say one of the bigger uh, differences is the type of measurement field. So types of measurements, of course, are coastal tide stations, bottom pressure recorders, and more commonly has been eyewitness accounts. And you also have arrival times, wave periods, uh, first motion. So was it a withdrawal of tsunami or was it the surge coming in, a, a rise of the wave coming in first? But in the last uh, maybe 15, 20 years, we've seen an increase in post-tsunami scientific surveys. So actually post-tsunami surveys have become the most common measurement types in the database. And so on the bottom left, you can see um, an image of the different types of, ops, uh, of measurements from a post-tsunami survey that we have in the database. So you can look at uh, post-tsunami survey measurements just for flow depth or run-up height or tsunami height. And, and so it's not just one type for a post-tsunami survey. So 
so source documents, I've been focused a lot on that. And so that's really important to us. We have over 8,000 uh, source documents for our events and run-ups. And this can include information data from tsunami warning centers, tsunami catalogs, reconnaissance reports, journal articles, newspaper articles, data from tsunami information centers, such as the International Tsunami Information Center. And they all are listed in the record entry for an event or run-up, as I had mentioned. So you, if you go to a specific event, you'll be able to see all the different sources that we, that we uh, use to retrieve our data from. Lastly about this, what I'll say is one of the more important fields for run-ups and events is the comments field. So you'll see different comments in, listed in there from all the different sources. So we don't list everything that a source will say about an event or a run-up, but we give you some of the highlights and more important comments that they have, especially where there's some differences. So especially as you go further back in time, there may be disagreements in um, the maximum water height or in the socioeconomic impacts. So we try to highlight those so that the user knows there is some disagreement and the user can make their determinations on their own and find those references and decide uh, which source to go with. So of course, there's limitations uh, to, to historical data that's largely defined as requiring 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 instrumental or eyewitness confirmation. Um, so I, I listed a few examples of some of the limitations here, but it might be mistaking other phenomena for tsunamis. Uh, there's an example here listed where uh, something was listed as a higher validity tsunami based on what looked like boiling water over an underwater volcano. And that was later clarified by uh, about a decade or so later um, by another document saying that this was a lower validity event. And similarly, lack of data. Um, I listed an example here of smaller tsunamis. We might have uh, reports saying that there was a series of small tsunamis, as, just like the example here, but we only have real data of when and where these occurred for a few of those tsunamis. So we are limited by that as well. And of course, um, what many of you know, the lack of record keeping traditions and such in different regions. And that's kind of what this slide here um, focuses on. So we do have a lot of limitations with historical data. Um, as I mentioned, require an instrumental or eyewitness confirmation. And this, this slide here shows you uh, the red marks are um, event, tsunami events from that source region listed on the right side. And if it's red, it means that uh, there were deaths associated with that tsunami. And if it's blue, it means it was observed, but no, uh, no fatalities occurred. So as you see, certain regions, the further you go back in time, the quicker you see these, the more you see these gaps in data. So that gives you an idea of, of some of our limitations here. Um, so some regions have a much longer uh, history than others, historical records than others. This, again, this is just for the Pacific and this is just confirmed tsunamis in this particular slide here. Um, so this really stresses the importance of geologic tsunami studies to understand the tsunami hazard. So uh, this slide here is just giving you a snapshot of the kind of data we have or how much data we have. So we have about 2,500 global tsunami events, 1,400 of those confirmed. Um, on the left, you can kind of see a, a bit of a uh, map of them. We also have about over 30,000 uh, global tsunami runups. And so you can see those. And the, uh, on the bottom right, you'll see a link that takes you to this map viewer. And then there's some gener general, um, statistics that people often ask for. So I put them on there um, as far as uh, generation mechanisms, what are the most common? And as you would imagine, earthquakes are 80%. And we actually just updated these. And then as well as global distribution of confirmed tsunami sources. Um, again, as you would imagine, it's uh, the Pacific is where most of the tsunami uh, events sources are. This is the kind of information that most commonly we get asked for and that you can get from our database. So access and discoverability of the data, of course, the, this is where the animation comes in. So originally tsunami data was largely in catalogs. And then in the early 2000s, uh, we developed searchable forms. On the left here, you can see the tradition, those traditional forms. You can filter it on any of the 40 some fields that we have, um, and then you get search results for that. Uh, we also do now uh, more recently have API access as well for programmatic access. And then not long after we developed the searchable forms, we had a separate interactive map viewer 
that was developed to allow geospatial searches of the database. And so you can see that in the middle. It looked a lot different when we first developed it. This it looks a lot nicer now and uh, works is high functioning. So these two were the things, the two things we had for a long time. So for the forms, you we kind of talk about that for our advanced users, our hazard assessment professionals, tsunami scientists that are get, looking for a starting point of what's occurred in a certain region. And then they kind of take that as a launch, launching point for lit reviews or whatever it might be. The map viewers are often for, we've come to learn for our more, um, I guess, novice users, that might not be a great term to use, but a lot of uh, public educators, general public that they know they're looking for some tsunami data and they kind of have an idea of what they're looking for. And they can look, do some filtering and searching through this map, which actually links them to our database if they want more information. But you still have to know sort of what you're looking for on these. So we realized that we didn't have an introductory product. For, there's a lot of people emailing us general questions about tsunami data. They don't really know what to look for, what things mean, um, where, how many tsunamis occur. It's, it was a bit overwhelming. So that's when the development of the animation occurred. It allows for a story to be told, but still is interactive and allows for data discoverability. So when we started to have these conversations, we identified this need that we had people that didn't really know how to, what they were looking at for tsunami data. And we also had our goal of always wanting to ensure that the data reaches new users. And then in the last few years, we had um, a lot more remote and virtual learning going on. So we had a lot more requests for data products and some basic tsunami science products. So we had these needs and we said, okay, what can we do as an introductory uh, product that isn't as overwhelming as the search forms or perhaps as the map viewers? So our goal was to create an introductory product to Tsunami data, make it very easy to use and have uh, fast performance on it. And then we did have re reviewers going through this as well. So Lindsay will talk a little bit more about this, but we had expertise from education and tsunami scientists on this, reviewing this product. So one thing I'd like to stress is what this product is not intended to be. We have a lot of other products, as I mentioned, um, that you can get different types of tsunami data from. This is meant to, the animation is meant to be an introduction to tsunami data. So you will not have all the search and filter functions. You will not see things like travel time contours that you see on our map viewer here uh, on the right. And you won't see run-ups observations associated with that particular event. Here you have the 2011 J uh, Japanese tsunami. Um, so you can actually, on the map viewers, you can actually click on a tsunami event and ask to see all the associated run-ups for it. So that's what you're seeing here. All those little bars are run-up observations for the 2011 uh, tsunami. And of course, and then we also have deep ocean amplitude plots or energy plots as some people refer to them as for select events. So this again is meant to be an introductory product. So what did we end up creating with this? So we wanted it to be interactive still. We didn't want this to be a passive product. We wanted students and teachers to be able to, to uh, discover the data not just have it be a passive product. So events are clickable. As the animation runs, you can actually click on different events and get some of the basic data from them. Not all 40 something fields will come up. Um, we decided on a handful of fields that uh, talking to a few of our reviewers, we felt were the best fields to display. The, there's also a timeline that shows you as time moves on what year you're in, but you can also pause, stop it, move the time slider around and the map is interactive, so you can move the map. So it's centered on the Pacific to start, but maybe you want to look at the Caribbean, for example. And then the time range. So our database goes back as far as uh, 1650 BC, but we decided for this product, we wanted to have something a little bit uh, one more digestible. So it was a two to three minute animation if we started at 1850 um, AD. And we, we felt that 18, starting in 1850 was a good starting point to ensure a good global distribution of data and, a, and as, as, as I mentioned, a reasonable time length of the animation. Um, also, um, all validities are displayed in this animation. So not just a confirmed high validity tsunamis. Uh, in, in our conversations, we realized having, explaining the uncertainty of historical data was important. So knowing that some events may not have been tsunamis, but were thought to be at one point or, or 
we aren't quite sure yet. We wanted to show those so that students and educators could say, okay, the further you go back in time, you'll actually see a lot more of these low, lower validity events. Um, and of course here, we have it linked to the NCEI database. So if a tsunami were to occur today, um, you would see it on this animation within a few days um, and the data would be updated as it goes. So if, if there are new publications um, saying that an event is a high validity event, now, when it used to be a low validity event, we will change that and you will see it reflected here. Or if the death count, fatality counts change, you'll see that reflected here as well. Um, and lastly, we did uh, decide based on our conversations as well that a mobile friendly application was necessary. So here you'll see what the animation kind of looks like in this GIF. Um, as time goes on, you'll see that them pop up and then slowly fade away. And you, as I said, you could zoom in on the map anywhere you, you want. Um, you can filter by causes. So we have the main causes there, volcanic. So in this case, you filtered out everything but the earthquakes. You can move the time slider around to select years. And of course, um, the legend, um, the bigger the symbol means the, the more uh, de deadly the event was for tsunamis. So you can get an idea of how the bigger it is, the students will be able to find out how big of an impact it had. And if, like I said, if you click on an event, you can get some basic details and it can link you through additional information links that you see there, you can, it'll take you straight to the database for that particular event so that you can get all the information you needed, all the references listed, all 40 some fields that we have um, will be available to you there. And now I will be switching over to uh, Lindsay who will talk about some of the educational resources associated with this product. Hello everyone, I'm Lindsay. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit, as Nick said, about the education side. So once the time-lapse animation tool was developed, we needed to find a way to distribute it and get it into the hands of its intended audiences. Um, based on the tool's origins that Nick talked about, um, kind of the most natural means to do this was to create an educational component. So this led us to develop an interactive guided activity with a teacher guide for grades six through 12 and general public audiences. So during the development phase, these resources were distributed uh, to and reviewed by educators in different states, some that were already teaching about tsunamis in their classroom and some that were not. Um, their expertise and feedback were incorporated into the final product prior to release. And this also helped us kind of define our target age range. Um, these products, as Nick has said before, were designed to provide an introduction to historical tsunami events and associated data for students and teachers. They are not a comprehensive tsunami science curriculum, but they are resources that could be used to add that tsunami element to existing earth science lesson plans. Next slide, please. And so with our background as data scientists, um, educational standards are not our area of expertise, but it was still extremely important to us to make sure that we were fulfilling the needs identified by standards that teachers are currently working within. Um, so the NCEI outreach and education team identified these two middle school and high school earth and human activity standards that we focused the bulk of this resource around. Uh, to give you a quick summary, the first directly addresses the analysis and interpretation of tsunami data, how we apply it to forecasting future events, and how we can mitigate their effects. The second focuses on how natural hazards, in this case tsunamis, have influenced our daily lives and the world around us. Though these resources were specifically designed for science purposes in mind, um, it's fair to say that the data that's accessed by the animation tool has relevance across so many other disciplines. There's numerical data, which obviously would apply in a mathematical situation. We have historical, geography, um, even applying to English where you could have a creative writing kind of situation where students can take information from a historical event and maybe create their own I survive type story. Next slide, please. So the teacher guide is a web-based resource and it highlights the basic use and navigation of the time-lapse animation tool. 
It includes detailed information about each of the tsunami worksheet questions, and it includes videos that visibly demonstrate the actions that are required to get the necessary information out of the animation tool. It also directs users to significant historical events that highlight key tsunami concepts. For example, the 1960 Southern Chile event is used to demonstrate how a large event can have devastating effects far from the source of an event. Additional resources are also linked throughout the teacher guide for convenience and examples of these resources include all of the other nat NCEI natural hazard products that Nick talked about earlier and other educational products that NCEI has created in the past, tsunami event summaries, glossaries, links to tsunami warning and information centers, and many, many more. Next slide, please. Now the tsunami worksheet is available in a fillable and printable format that supports use in both virtual and in-person learning environments. It was really important to us that we could create something that could be easily and seamlessly integrated into online learning platforms, especially when these transitions sometimes can be rather unexpected or even really abrupt. Um, though through this worksheet, students will experience interaction with um, every animation tool feature and menu that Nick showed you previously. And the guided prompts and questions will lead them through identifying where tsunamis are happening and what's causing them. They'll get to be or gain exposure to a variety of different events through these questions. For example, we have a question where students explore and share details of a tsunami that's either on or near the month and year of their birth. And by sharing with the class, they're indirectly exposed to several events, but really only having to focus on just that one. And then lastly, we made sure to include open-ended questions where students can think about how we communicated hazards in a world before the digital age, and also kind of try to brainstorm creative ways that we might mitigate tsunami risk in the future. Next slide, please. And so to close us out, getting scientific data sets into classrooms at any level is a tremendous way to support our next generation scientists. And the time lapse animation delivers not just a data set, but the very same living data that natural hazard scientists are using on a daily basis. We are certainly very, very excited to add the time lapse animation tool and its educational activity to our natural hazard products. Um, and we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, all of the information that we talked about in this talk and all of the tsunami data and information that we have to offer can be found at the URL on the screen. And of course, you can feel free to reach out to us by email at any time at has.info at noaa.gov. Once again, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thanks very much, Lindsay and Nick. I, great presentation. Um, I just want to remind those of you who are tuning in, you're welcome to go ahead and submit questions or comments via the Q&A uh, box, which you can access on your control panel on the lower part of your screen. Um, in the meantime, yeah, I just want to want to thank Lindsay and, and, and Nick for um, sharing this, this really great new resource with us today. I think there's um, a lot of, you know, historical tsunami information out there, and it's great to see your efforts kind of make that data more visible and more usable through tools like, like this uh, time-lapse animation. Um, I, I actually have questions for both of you, so I don't know if you have a preference for who goes first. Um, if, if not, maybe I'll, I'll start with Lindsay. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's great to see, you know, the, a lot of these the tools that you guys have made, um, having them freely available online for, for you know, uh, a wide range of users to interact with, you know, everybody from teachers to the general public. I'm curious to know if you've had any uh, interest from museums or other institutions in using your tool as part of in-person displays. You know, I think that's, it's, it has applications in so many different places. Um, initially, I mean, we started in with education of, we wanted this for introductory users, but I think as it's been developed and as we've created these tools, I think it's very obvious it has, I mean, we could set this up in a public library and it could be done as a passive um, kind of program in a public library that anyone could use from, you know, 
young families to homeschool families to just anyone that's interested in tsunamis. And it's kind of, the activity is self-guided really. I mean, you could just follow through and learn whatever you want to learn. And I think museums, I did get a question uh, when we presented this at AGU and somebody did say, you know, is this in the tsunami museum in um, Hawaii? And of course it's not yet, but um, I did think that was a brilliant idea. I, I, I definitely could see the animation playing on a loop in a tsunami museum somewhere. Yeah, that's great. Um, maybe a quick question for Nick. I understand that the tsunami tool here is is kind of intended to be just an introduction to the the data set, but I'm curious to know if uh, if the animation tool has allowed you or others to to find uh, historical tsunami records that maybe had otherwise been unknown. I mean, through the animation, um, did, like or, or maybe like associating orphan records with the with an unknown tsunami. Have there been any Kind of connections made in that way, um, given the the you know size of the data set that you have. I'm just wondering if this tool has kind of helped you to tie some of those pieces together. Um, I you know I can't say that that's necessarily happened for us. You know we a lot of what we do when we do our kind of qualitative analysis with historical data is uh is look at the more in depth data, so the database itself, the traditional forms, and all the different fields. And, and that's where usually where we find things like that, like duplicate events, for example. Sure. We realize that one source uh, has this one event with a slightly different data as another source, and we'll, we'll find these errors in the database, um, really just errors that occur from all these different catalogs. And that's usually where we find those. Having said that, now this, this uh, tool has been used a lot by different program partners in the National Tsunami Program, Hazard Mitigation Program. And so we have users that may not have looked at our other more, I guess, technical products like the forms and the map viewers. So emergency managers, for example, that have looked and seen and said, we use this for a public outreach event and we noticed this one event, um, this particular case was in the Caribbean and said, we see there's two tsunamis here that occurred in, in the same, time for, in a very close time frame is that an error and so that's when we explain no there was actually one of them was the big tsunami that you're familiar with uh, that 1918 uh, tsunami in Puerto Rico um, that caused the deaths and damages but there was actually a much smaller tsunami that occurred not too far off that date and so it was something that wasn't as uh, apparent to people but seeing it in this animation allowed them to discover a tsunami had more of the about the tsunami hazard in their own region of interest. So I think we're seeing a lot more people, from what I can tell, um, understand and access the tsunami data and not be as reliant on, I guess, kind of the traditional reports about tsunamis in their region. They're starting to see, oh, we do have smaller tsunamis. It's not just the big ones. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I mean, I think that speaks to the power of this tool for helping to share this data set with people and help them visualize and engage with it um, engage with it more so i think that that's wonderful um, we do have a couple questions that have come in this first one's from um, an anonymous attendee and we maybe nick has kind of already started to touch on some of this but um, our attendee asks what anecdotal feedback have you received so far about the tool and the data that goes into it i don't know if, if you have anything specific to add to what you've already said nick or maybe lindsay wants to speak to this from from the education side um, I, I can jump in real quick and then I'll turn it to Lindsay. But one of the things we've heard is that is the is there's very positive feedback. I mean, of course, there's always issues that we need to fix. There's bug, I won't say there's not. There's bug fixes like any other application <laughs> that we need to improve on. And and of, um, some of the feedback we've gotten though that has been good is that this is interactive. And that's one of the big things that we wanted. We see a lot of animations out there um, that have been developed on YouTube videos and such, but they're very passive. And I think that's one of the things that I've gotten a lot of good feedback from is that they're glad that they can click on something. Uh, so we have a lot of general public users that have said, oh, I know nothing about tsunamis or very little about tsunamis. And now this is interesting. And to some extent they're like, this is mesmerizing because it's all these dots kind of, so it, there's an initial intrigue and interest because of the, the stylistic components, quite frankly, and the mm -hmm. geospatial components. But then they are able to interact and actually learn a little bit about tsunamis when they wouldn't have. So I think that's been one of the positives. 
that have come out of this. One of the things that we're uh, striving to do with our next, with an update to this is develop a kind of an exportable video file from it. Because we do have some people with really low um, bandwidth, and but they still want to distribute this in some capacity. So creating an MP4, uh, for example, is that you can export. So that's one of our hopes to do that in the, in the future. So I'll let Lindsay Great. talk a little bit more. Yeah, any anecdotal feedback um, that you've gotten so far on, on the tool or the data? Uh, I, I would say the tool has been out longer than the educational activity. So uh, right now, most of the feedback has been on the tool itself. Um, to this date, I haven't heard anything about the educational activity, but again, we just released it and we're still working on getting it to the right places. Um, mm -hmm. Both the tool and the educational activity, as Nick was talking about, is essentially at version 1.0. Um, I'm really hoping for feedback because I, I mean, that means a lot of things. Number one, it means that people are using it, which is ultimately the goal, the first goal. Um, and two, it helps us improve it and make it better because a tool is only useful if it's useful to them. And I mean, we can create tools all day long, but if it's not what people need or are interested in, or if we can change it in some way to make it more accessible and easier to use, um, that's definitely we're 100% on board <laughs> with working within those. Excellent. Okay. Uh, another question here. Um, says, Hello, just want to know if any uh, Mexico government agency um, or, or entity has shared information with you. Um, and if you know if Mexico has equipment that helps in the effort to detect tsunamis. So I'm not sure if you're aware of kind of the provenance of all the different uh, pieces of data that have that have gone into this? So yeah, this is a, it's a good question. This is a, you know, this is a global database. And so we do get a lot of data from other countries. We, we are, we do serve as a world data service for geophysics, as I had mentioned, and we are part of a different UNESCO ICG, so tsunami warning systems for the Pacific and the Caribbean, for example, we attend those meetings where there's data sharing and, and Mexico is one of the participants for both those basins. And they provide a lot and share a lot of their data. Um, they have, um, like most countries, not all countries, but have a national warning, tsunami warning center there. Um, and we do get data that from them that we input into these database, this database. And actually the Servicio Mariográfico Nacional from uh, the UNAM, the uni uh, university there, they, mm -hmm. uh, after every tsunami, they provide their tide gauge uh, readings for a tsunami event from their different coastlines. And so we do pull information from them as well. So we do get information from various sources uh, for the Tonga event that just happened in January. Um, you know, for example, we just put in some post -tsunami, preliminary post-tsunami survey data from Fiji. Um, so this is not just US data for this global database. Um, this is from all over the world uh, and we interact with as many partners as we can. It's a bit overwhelming at times because there's a lot of tsunami studies happening these days and to be able to identify them all and then input them all is a big challenge for the, you know, the two of us. Um, so just to answer the question in short though, yes, we do. We interact with many countries, including Mexico who has a very uh, good system in place. Great, so th thanks for the question there. Um, I'll give folks just another minute here. If you've got any lingering questions or comments, please feel free to enter those in the, in the chat. Um, one, one final question for me. I'm curious to know if this effort, this you know, outreach tool here in the educational component, how unique is this within uh, your agency there at NOAA? I mean, are there, are there prior examples that you looked to for inspiration or is this really kind of a, a, a new direction and something that your team came up with uh, on its own? For the tool itself, um, there was a very similar tool that was developed that actually was our inspiration for this tool, but it was by the Smithsonian on volcanoes. So it was a bit different than the way ours works, but um, it was it's a very good tool. So if you're interested in kind of gas emissions and from volcanoes and such, go to their website. They have a really nice tool. And that's where we got inspiration on what we could do. Um, but we, you know, as far as products similar to this, we hadn't seen any at NOAA. There's a lot of great tsunami educational products through the National Tsunami Education uh, Hazard and Mitigation Program. Um, so this is this was something new to us. For the, I'll let Lindsay speak about the educational component. That, as she mentioned, that was a little bit outside of our realm of expertise and our lane. Um, but we want, we knew that that's 
the group that we needed to touch base with because that's where we get a lot of user requests and questions from is educators. And so we can talk to the data, but we're not always the best people to communicate that to educators. Um, so we needed some help on how do we take this technical data and package it for educators. So um, anyway, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but maybe Lindsay can answer it better. That's great. I don't know that I can answer it much better either. Um, you know, my my closest um, experience to for any of this going in at the beginning, I was raised by a sixth grade teacher. Like, but that's all I had. Um, and so NOAA as a whole provides a lot of um, data information for classrooms. They have a full, or the NOAA Education Department has a full data in the classroom um, section. But for us, we wanted to get something out quickly. We were really reacting in response to all of our education moving to a virtual environment and people going, I need to teach earth science and I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> you know, what can you get me today? Um, so it was, what can we get out there now and where can we go to in the future? Um, I definitely personally wanted something that could just slide right into the data in the classroom website. There's a whole bunch of coral bleaching, uh, ocean acidification, all kinds of data. Um, it's just time was really of the essence for this one. And um, obviously funding, Nick and, I, Nick and I did this as a side project, really. Um, the tool was made, um, but getting it out there was really just us thinking this might be a good way to start spreading the word about what we have. And in doing so, I think it became clear that a lot of people just didn't know what NCEI had. Um, and I think this is the perfect way. I mean, we can show you in little blips and colors uh, what kind of information we have. 